so good afternoon everyone uh, uh, our, uh, uh, we have the privilege today as a speaker to have uh, uh, Arif Babul, uh, which is, uh, who is a, a distinguished professor at the University of Victoria in Victoria, Canada. Uh, a few uh, words about the background. Uh, uh, Arif was born in Mwanza, if I'm spelling it correctly, in Tanzania, and grew uh, in Toronto, in Canada. Uh, he did his PhD at Princeton University, and uh, over the years, uh, he has held a number of awards and positions, including a faculty position at Northwest University, NATO Science Fellow at Cambridge University, Kavli Frontiers of Science Fellow, Leverhulme Visiting Professor at Oxford and Durham Universities, and University of Zurich Pauli Center Guest Professor. Uh, Arif uh, is a theorist and has worked on a range of topics from gravitational lensing to galaxy formation. And he's an expert on groups and clusters of galaxies, particularly the physics of the secrum galactic gas surrounding large galaxies. Most recently, he has been using observations as well as state-of-the-art numerical simulations to study massive galaxies in the universe, exploring topics like how these galaxies form, the role of stellar and aging feedback on their evolution, and especially the nature and the impact of the gaseous flows into and out of those systems. So it's uh, going to be an interesting talk. I'll leave the stage to you. Thank you. Thank you, Riff. Thank you very much, Constantinos. Can I, I'm assuming my voice is coming across clearly. Yep. Great. So um, my talk today, the title of the talk is uh, Formation and Evolution of Massive Galaxies in the Cosmos. And the sub title is successes and opportunities and hopefully as I go on that will become clear where the where the subtitle is coming from I'm just going to set myself a little timer so that I know where I am in terms of uh, the talk um, on the side of the screen you can see a list of names um, these are this is a a, a, a limited list because the group actually is much bigger than this. Um, but I would like to give a shout out to Lila Young, whose work I am mostly going to be talking about. Um, other people that you may recognize are Ilani, Konstantinos, and I see that uh, Ewan O'Sullivan is on, uh, on, on, on this talk as well. And so, uh, I'll say hello to all of you guys. Um, and uh, as I say, this is a subset of a group of people that I've been working with, um, you know, looking to compare observations with uh, state-of-the-art uh, numerical simulation results. So before I start, let me give you a brief outline of the talk itself. Um, this is the 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 intent uh, outline. Um, I'm going to start with a brief uh, overview of the contemporary galaxy formation models. I will then talk about how one can go about trying to stress test these models, and specifically stress test them using massive galaxies. Um, I will, of course, talk a little bit about the results, and that's where the successes and opportunities will come into play. And uh, finally, if there is time, I will uh, discuss a, a slightly different topic. It's related to massive galaxies, but in a sense, it's a, a, a uh, it'll peel off from the main discussion that I will be giving you uh, and speak about protoclusters and formation of the most massive galaxies in the cosmos. Um, I have to say that the last time I gave this talk, I. Um, did not reach that particular phase. So as I say, this is an intention, uh, but, but it, I may not get there. So what you're seeing right now is a, on your screen is an image of the large scale structure uh, that has been generated by uh, two of the contemporary models of galaxy formation um, in the lower uh, right-hand side, you can see a sequence of boxes. These are numerical simulations carried out by illustrious TNG. Um, they range from 300 megaparsec sized cubes uh, to 50 megaparsec sized cubes. 
the 50 megaparsec size cubes have exquisite resolution and the 300 megaparsec box have poorer resolution, but then of course they cover a much uh, larger volume uh, of, of, the, of the simulated universe. And in the upper right, uh, so upper left, you see a, a image uh, from the Romulus simulation. Uh, again, the resolution of the Romulus simulation and the size of the Romulus simulation is comparable to TNG 50. So these are two of uh, amongst the highest resolution cosmological simulations that have been carried out uh, to date. Uh, what we see when we look at these simulations is that, uh, and, and certainly if you've been following this field for several years, you may actually already be aware that these simulations, these models of galaxy formation and evolution have made tremendous leaps forward in terms of trying to arrive at reality. And what do I mean by reality? The end goal is to understand uh, how our present universe has formed, to understand galaxy populations in our present universe, not just uh, today, but also as a function of time. So to be able to not just predict uh, galaxies and classes of galaxies and morphology of galaxies at the present time, but also to be able to do this as a function of time going back. Uh, so in some sense, the models eventually become predictive. And the, uh, you know, in, as I mentioned, the models have improved over the years and have made dramatic leaps forward in terms of getting uh, closer and closer to reality. I'm going to give you a little bit of a flavor by what I mean by reality. And uh, this is partly for members of the audience who are not entirely familiar with uh, the subject of cosmological simulations. What I have plotted here, so in the left column, I have plotted two sort of specific results from the Eagle simulation. And the, at the top, what you're looking at is the stellar density. This is the uh, density of stars in the simulation box as a function of time. So we're going back to higher redshifts. And the, uh, the, the points that you see there are observations. And there are, of course, several different variants of the models that are being shown. The details about these variants is not important. What is important is that I would like to highlight that the blue line, what they call the reference Eagle model, actually does remarkably well in capturing the stellar density uh, of the universe going back. It, it has a little bit of an issue uh, once you get up to very high re uh, redshift, but this is partly a result of simulation resolution itself. Um, and, and I will come back to that in a second. In the bottom plot, I show the galaxy stellar mass function. And uh, again, you see different models being presented. Uh, you see observations being shown. And what you see here is that the, the, model, the model results and the observations themselves are in pretty good agreement. But there is one caveat that I'd like to highlight right up front, because I think for particularly for graduate students who are getting into this area, it's important to be aware of this, that these simulations involve hundreds of physical processes. And often these physical processes cannot be directly modeled. You know, for example, star formation happens on scales that are much smaller than we can re physically resolve in, in these cosmological simulations. And so star formation is modeled through some prescription. They are reasonable prescriptions based on observations. And, uh, uh, but nonetheless, they are prescriptions. And because they are prescriptions, they often have free parameters. And since they have free parameters, you need to have a way to calibrate these free parameters. And the calibration often involves trying to make sure a priori that you are matching the population of galaxies around the knee these are M, M star or Milky Way like galaxies. Um, these galaxies, you know, are, are not the biggest. 
and nor are they the smallest galaxies in the universe, but they are the galaxies that contain most of the stellar mass in the universe. Uh, and so the circle here illustrates where the calibration is being done. So at some level, you could say that the match at the, in the calibration zone is, is, is predetermined because that's how the models were established. How the model fares at fainter end and at the brighter end, and then going back and forth in time is, a, is, is the key test of these models. On the uh, right-hand side, you see results for TNG. Um, one challenge in this area is that the groups don't always necessarily plot the same quantities. And so it's, it's often difficult to make direct comparisons. Um, in the top right, I show you a, a measure that's known as the cosmic star formation history. It's plotting uh, solar masses per megaparsec cubed. So it's telling you what the star formation density is as a function of time going back. And we see from observations that, that going back from today, the star formation density increases. There is a peak. This is the, you know, the, what's known as the cosmic noon. This is where greatest amount of star formation activity happened, roughly around redshift between two and three. And then if you go further back in time, there is a decrease uh, back towards earlier epochs. And you can see that the model here uh, does remarkably well. There are two models shown here. There is the current TNG results and the earlier uh, best illustrious model. Uh, from the cosmic star formation history perspective, they are both equally good, but there was a problem, which is why there is a newer version of the TNG, the dark, so sort of the black or dark blue one is the more recent version. And you can see the reason why the group needed to go back and, and revisit the model was because when they plotted the galaxy stellar mass function, the red curve uh, tremendously over predicts the number of galaxies at the faint end. So again, around the red, red uh, uh, ellipse here, this is where the calibration is being done. And then, of course, uh, when you look at the fainter end, you see that there is a, a significant overprediction that wasn't exactly good for the model. And so there has been some work done in terms of trying to correct, understand, and correct for that. Um, this results on this page, I'm showing you uh, results from Simba. The, Many of you will be familiar. Simba is uh, over, uh, overseen by Ramil Dave, and Ramil was at, in Cape Town for a long time. Uh, Ramil is continuing his work in Simba. Um, we are uh, we collaborate with Ramil, so some of these results are, 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 are work that is ongoing in terms of trying to understand. Um, but here, the results that are being shown are again the galaxy stellar mass function and that you see that in the two columns on the left. Uh, here the plot is showing the galaxy stellar mass function uh, show as a function of epoch. So in the lowest, uh, the, 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 the plot at the right, in the right column at the very bottom should be thought of as the present day galaxy stellar mass function. The green curve here is the total uh, Simba result. And you can see that there is a excellent match, but again, I have highlighted for you the, the regime where the calibration is being done. Uh, now here, if you go back in time, you can see how the Simba model fares against observations. And you know, from, from the perspective here, it looks very good. Uh, but again, it's worth keeping in mind that once you are looking at the cosmic star formation histories, and you're looking at uh, Milky Way or M star galaxies, all of these calculations at some level are being dominated by what's going on in this thing. So what you should take away from these is that the galaxies of ordinary, uh, so the evolution of the ordinary galaxies, Milky Way mass galaxies, going back to Redshift 6 is being captured extremely well. And in fact, going further back in time, it's, it's being captured extremely well. Um, 
the plot on the right is showing you the cosmic star formation density. And there, again, you can see that the match is, reason, is, is reasonably good. Um, and again, I highlight that this is this particular measure, this particular statistic is, is strongly influenced by M star like galaxies in the present universe. Uh, I'm going to speak here just about the plot on the left hand side. This is a uh, results from the Romulus simulation. I mentioned Romulus earlier as being one of the highest resolution simulations. It is a relatively small box. Uh, again, there's always this tension, uh, higher the resolution, the smaller the volumes tend to be just because we are limited by the amount of computing time that's available. Uh, if you make a Romula -like, Romulus like box and run hundreds of megaparsecs, that simulation can run for a year and often gets stuck at around redshifts of two and takes a long time to break through the redshift two barrier. Um, so it's just the nature of, of computation and computing power available at this present time. So it's a smaller box. And as a result, the focus has been on uh, uh, lower mass galaxies up to this point in time. But you can see that this the results being shown here is the stellar mass halo mass relationship as a function of halo mass and at the in the regime where most of the galaxies are this actually is tracking observations uh, very very well this is what the images made from two of the highest resolution simulations look like you can see that with resolution, we are now reaching a point where we can actually start to make galaxies whose internal structures are resembling reality. You see spiral, uh, spiral galaxies, you see spiral waves in the galaxies, you can see elliptical or early type galaxies, at least up here I'm showing you a elliptical galaxy, you can see uh, um, somewhere here an S0 like galaxy, so we can actually now capture the full morphology of galaxies. The, the full galactic zoo is, is, is available in the numerical simulations. You can go in, you can look at the properties of these galaxies. You can look at how they originated. And these are the amongst the more powerful uh, um, benefits of having numerical simulation that they, you know, once you understand the physics and the processes shaping galaxies in the numerical simulations, there is, a, there is a scope for using this information to interpret observations. Um, there wasn't very much else. I just wanted to show you what these posters look like and to show you how, how reasonable and how realistic these galaxies are starting to look in these simulations. And so here, I'm going to now stop at, with the first part, the recap, and recap my uh, summary of contemporary galaxy formation models. So as I mentioned, we've had incredible progress over the past 10 years, and that the models that are existing right now are remarkably successful at replicating sub-Milky Way-like and Milky Way-like galaxies. Um, but with the caveat that this sort of, at least the Milky Way-like zone is also the zone over which the systems are calibrated. Um, so the next question is, how do you stress test these galaxy uh, models? And we have chosen to look at stress testing the galaxy model by looking at the properties of the galaxies that are more massive than the than the uh, regime over which the calibration took place. So in other words, this is where the calibration is taking place. We're interested in seeing what happens out here in terms of uh, the properties of the galaxies in detail, and also in terms of eventually the evolution of the galaxies in this particular regime, the, the massive end of the galaxy spectrum. So specifically, we are interested in looking at galaxies whose uh, stellar masses are, are, are exceeding 10 to the 11 solar masses. And uh, at least in this talk, I'm going to concentrate on results uh, coming from 
central galaxies in galaxy groups. I will uh, often just refer to these as BGGs for the brightest uh, group galaxies. So whenever I say BGG, you should just take that to mean it's the central galaxy in a galaxy group. I am going to focus mostly on the Romulus simulations, but I will touch upon uh, TNG and Simba and, and, and Eagle results along the way. And I do want to emphasize that this work has been led by Lila Young, who's a graduate student uh, presently in Australia. So to start with, I should give you an overview of what the Romulus simulations are. Romulus simulations are somewhat different from the other classes of simulations that I've mentioned, Simba, Eagle, and TNG, in the sense, in two sense. Uh, first of all, in most simulations, the black holes, we know that, that galaxy formation depends very strongly on black hole feedback, particularly at the massive end. So this is the regime we're interested in. These are where the differences actually become important. Um, in most simulations, black holes are, are seeded inside halos once they reach a certain mass threshold. And then the black holes are put at the centers of these halos. And as the simulation evolves and you have merging going on, um, merging in the sense usually means that if two black holes uh, get reasonably close to each other, or in some instances when halos merge, almost immediately the two black holes in the centers get, um, get just basically get merged and moved to the center of the new halo. So there is a, there's a degree of ad hocness, if you will, uh, present in the sense that you are not actually following black hole dynamics. In Romulus, the seeding is done differently. Uh, in here, seeding is of black holes is done by identifying regions that are star forming but low metallicity. The argument being that regions where there is very low metallicity will be prone to forming larger gas clouds that can collapse, and these large gas clouds can then collapse to form super uh, su uh, supermassive black holes or black holes, the seed black holes. The black hole seeds that go into Romulus are about 10 to the six solar masses. Um, so they are not seeded at the center of halos. They can be seeded anywhere in the, in the simulation volume. And then the second thing is the black hole dynamics is actually followed. So there, the, in, in these simulations, we can follow dynamical friction and so black holes really have to physically get very close to each other before they are merged, which also means that now you have an opportunity to study black hole, black hole binaries uh, in group environments and, and, and all sorts of fun things like that, which we are actually doing. Uh, my collaborators who ran Romulus simulations like to also say that it's organic because there was no tuning of uh, any galaxy properties greater than uh, 10 to the 12 solar mass systems. Uh, and that uh, large scale outflows are produced naturally. You see an image at the bottom of the screen showing an example of, of large scale outflows uh, being generated from a central galaxy here that reach out 20 to 30 uh, kiloparsecs in scale. And we have several simulations of Romulus uh, groups. We call this a suite of Romulus simulations. We have zoom simulations of a, of a, of a poor cluster slash rich group. It sits right at the, at the boundary, the artificial boundary between groups and clusters. It's a 10 to the 14 solar mass system. And uh, there are two papers cited there that describe this particular system, or at least the early results from these two particular, this particular system. We have two additional zoom simulations of, of uh, bona fide groups, uh, G1 and G2. And the two systems are in the mass range uh, 13.5. Uh, that shouldn't be 15, that should be uh, 14. Uh, so that's an error on my part. And then um, we have a volume, a 25 megaparsec volume that uh, contains 
uh, a range of masses within that volume. And so we have our uh, intermediate and low mass groups coming from that particular box. We combine all of these simulations together for the results that we are talking about. To give you an idea of what the resolution is, uh, I you know draw your attention to the top uh, right. It says that the gravitational resolution is 250 parsecs. The hydro resolution here is 50 parsecs, and the mass resolution is 10 to the five. Um, this is mass resolution in gas and in dark matter are both at, at about 10 to the five solar mass level. Okay, so let me go back and start by discussing the results from these simulations. Um, and um, let me start by talking about the stellar mass halo mass relationship. So I showed you the plot on the left. I'm going to now, I've extended it. So now that there are, there are more points plotted on the, in the second uh, ellipse that, that I'm pointing out right now, um, that's looking at the stellar mass halo mass relationship in systems that are greater than uh, uh, 10 to the 12 solar masses. As you can see, there are relatively few of them. Um, the numbers vary uh, from, well, the numbers are about 38. Uh, halos altogether. And on the right-hand side, I expand this volume, um, this region further, and you can see a lot more other data points and simulation results being plotted. I'm not going to talk about the other simulation results in, at the moment. I'm, I actually have a second slide where we will discuss that a little bit more. What I want you to focus on is, first of all, the various lines you can see the black lines, the dotted lines, the gray lines, the, the large number of data points, the green open stars and filled stars, the blue data points. And these are all observational results. And so what I want you to take away from this in the first instance is that the stellar mass halo mass relationship um, is, is difficult to get it difficult to get the stellar mass. Uh, it depends on some assumptions that, that you need in order to take observe, observations and turn them into a stellar mass estimate. It is difficult to take uh, to compute what the halo mass is. And so there are uncertainties built into these results. And so even within the scope of observations, you can see that there is a quite a bit of spread. And so when comparing simulations, it's not usually a good idea to compare it to just one result. Um, in this instance, we've chosen to plot a range of observations so that you can see where the simulation results sit with respect to the, the representative spread in the observed results. The red points here show you what the Romulus results are. The dark, uh, sort of the filled red circles are showing you results for the Romulus BGGs. These are central galaxies in groups. And then central galaxies in halos that are below 12.5 solar masses, uh, which we do not categorize as groups, uh, sit uh, here. You can see them, we plot them as open circles. They're, you know, uh, it's an artificial uh, distinction, if you will, in the sense that there is a continuity of structure here. We have picked systems that actually have three uh, bright galaxies and bright again is in some sense an arbitrary definition, but bright galaxies to call the systems that are shown in filled circles as groups. The first takeaway here is that as far as the halo mass stellar mass relationship is concerned, uh, Romulus seems to be doing quite well within the spread of observations. If you look really, really, really carefully, you will see that the last point, Romulus C, is perhaps tending upwards. And so if you were to look at the overall trend, you could argue that the trend is slowly creeping up and that you know if we were to extend this, um, maybe there's going to be tension at the highest mass end. But nonetheless, this, this is one point, and the danger of one point is that there is cosmic variance, and the next point could very well be down here. 
So, you know, until we get more results run at this high mass end, at this point, I, I would say take that one point as a as you know with a grain of salt. On the other hand, as you will see the results, these initial sort of hint of a of a of a shallower trend in Romulus um, may actually be pointing to something to be concerned about. So there are two possibilities open here, but at least as far as the bulk of the Romulus systems are concerned, they are, are, are in excellent agreement with the observations. Now I've repeated that same plot here in the left, uh, except now I'm not going to focus on Romulus. I want to focus on the yellow line, which is the Simba result. And you can see the Simba result over the same range. If you are just concerned about whether Simba is consistent with the observations, the answer is yes, it is. The band is fairly broad and the band captures all of the uh, spread within the observations. Uh, what is noteworthy is that, that there are a lot more Simba galaxies available. And so if you can actually look at the trend and it is a more meaningful quantity at this point, and the trend really is shallow. And so, uh, whereas all the other lines tend to be dropping fairly steep, the most of the differences in the observations have to do more with the amplitude. Uh, Simba curve really is somewhat, somewhat shallower. You can look at the TNG result and you find uh, something similar, except that the line is a little bit more steeper and therefore a little bit more in agreement with the with the observations from this perspective. Eagle, uh, there are two classes of Eagle simulations that have been done. There's the standard reference box, and then there was a, 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 a larger box with coarser resolution done to try and capture clusters. And you can see that the standard box has a deficit uh, at the low mass end in terms of M star to M200. The curve is also uh, uh, shallower, oops, compared to, you know, comparable to the Simba results. And then when you do the cluster runs at a coarser resolution, you find that you actually overproduce the stellar content of these systems. And now you're skirting the upper edge uh, of, the, of, the, of the observed scatter. I just wanna point out that, that the way these things were calculated, the purple uh, crosses should really be comparable down here to uh, filled green circles. So there is, a factor of two to three offset between these results. So this is where things stand in terms of trying to understand massive galaxies. Um, I'm going to continue on. Uh, Konstantin, Konstantinos, can you give me a, a maybe a 10 minute heads up when, uh, when we're getting close to the end so I know when yeah. to start wrapping up? Okay, yeah, absolutely, great. yes. Um, the next relationship that I would like to, that we looked at was the kinematic relationship. And, you know, this is the generalized Faber-Jackson relationship here. The, again, the red points open and closed are the Romulus systems. The, um, the golden crosses here are, are, are X's, are results from Ilani um, on, from clusters of galaxies. The blue points are, are results from the, BGG in the CLOGS group sample. The gray points are the Atlas early type galaxies. And the, the quantity that's been plotted here is this generalized uh, velocity, which not just looks at the velocity dispersion, but also the rotational component. We know that the low mass galaxies, early type galaxies uh, can be divided into fast and slow rotators. And that uh, on, as far as the Faber-Jackson relationship is concerned, they tend to uh, follow slightly different branches. However, if you plot them in this generalized fashion, they actually do sit on a, on a universal relationship. And we can see that the Romulus results sit on that same relationship as well. Uh, on the right, I'm showing you a, a plot of the measure of the uh, ordered to random motion, so rotational motion to velocity dispersion uh, versus projected ellipticity. And again, the points, uh, the, 
blue points, the golden points, and the gray points are exactly what I described here. Clusters of galaxies, not surprisingly, clusters of galaxies are dominated by random motions of their stars. We have groups, and groups are have a greater spread in these uh, in this particular diagram. And then we have the Romulus systems, and the Romulus systems show considerable spread. And you know, at first instance, you could uh, I should mention that every Romulus galaxy here is shown, you know, appears three times from three different orientations. Um, the, the spread in the Romulus systems would make you think that there is uh, too much rotation here, but there, it is worth noting that the observational samples against which you can compare theory, at least on the group scale, um, uh, still needs considerable work. Samples are defined uh, either in the X-ray or in the optical, and if they're defined in the optical, Often there are constraints put on the nature of the BGGs. For example, the clogs sample that, that we are, uh, Ilani, myself, uh, you and have been working on for uh, several years now, um, that sample has been chosen so that the central galaxy is preferentially an early type galaxy. We also know that the Atlas systems are, are preferentially early type galaxies. So, uh, that, that was a target criteria. And so uh, the question is, are there other kinds of BGGs? Are there BGGs that are not early type? That's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting question in its own right. And I will touch upon that in a second. But at this point, let me just leave you with this plot that says that at least in the numerical simulations, we see a much broader range of, of V over sigma than, say, present in the clogs sample or in the Atlas sample. Um, and, and of course, the results for the clusters are not entirely surprising. This is the morphology of the central galaxies in Romulus. And you can see we actually capture a full range of morphologies from early type uh, elliptical systems to early type S0 systems to disk systems that are actively forming stars. It may come as a surprise that there are central galaxies in groups that are forming uh, stars. But when you look at samples that are often looked at, uh, defined in the optical without additional criteria, you find that, that this, of course, is present. Uh, before I show you that statistic, I should show you a result from a very recent paper that was looking at the Muse results for the Clogs galaxies. And even the Clogs galaxies uh, show evidence of, of disks, uh, in not necessarily star-forming disks, but certainly disks that are gas-rich and rotating. And so the fact that these central galaxies are have to necessarily be early type is not entirely uh, um, um, accurate. This is a result that came from a SDSS analysis. And uh, the results show whether what the fraction of our central galaxies are early type versus late type. And the curve to first focus in on is this red and blue dotted lines. You can see that at, as you go towards lower and lower mass halos, so groups that are lower mass groups, tend to be uh, dominated by uh, late type central galaxies. And then as you get to higher and higher masses, it's not until you get to about uh, thir so 10 to the uh, 13 or almost three times 10 to the, uh, uh, sorry, two times 10 to the 13 solar masses that, that you pass the point where the early types start to dominate. So the, the, the idea that the early types dominate tends to be uh, almost exclude low mass groups. It you know, focuses attention on the high mass groups. When you look at the uh, Romulus results, uh, you find that the Romulus results for the lowest mass groups is actually quite uh, reasonable and matches the observations. Uh, on the other hand, when you look at the Romulus statistics at the high mass end, we find that there is a, a greater number of uh, uh, late type galaxies. So this 
again is a a something to be concerned about and i will come back to this in a second we find that at, at least up to about 10 to the 12.8 or so 10 to the 13 things are reasonably good and then we are now starting to see an excess of uh, this key galaxies in the higher mass groups which seems to go uh, you know it, it, in contrary to observations. I'm going to look at the star formation stellar mass relationship very quickly. Um, I'm going to focus your attention to the plot on the right. The plots on the left just show you the results for uh, illustrious and eagle uh, separately. But here I can sort of summarize what's going on. What you are seeing here is the, um, the, the star formation main sequence. Uh, Whitaker's results are the upper uh, line, the black solid and dashed extension lines. The, the band that is normally sort of used to categorize star forming galaxies is shown there. It's the, it's the band that, that is bordered by the solid line up here and this dot dashed line at the, uh, you know, just a little bit further down. All galaxies in this zone are considered star forming galaxies. Then there are a whole bunch of observational samples. There are uh, there is this, there's one sample, the green one. There is the Ilani's clock sample that's coming in in blue. There is a sample of clusters of galaxies uh, of various types coming in. Uh, and what you can see here is that there are um, there are galaxies. If you you know if, if I was to zoom in on this, you would see that there are green pluses scattered in the star forming band. There are also uh, some blue crosses scattered in there. There are definitely cool core clusters that are scattered into this, into this zone. And so there are definitely uh, BCGs as well as BGGs that are star forming, but then there's a large fraction of the population that is quenched and not actively star forming. And you know, again, the samples are, are are inhomogeneous, and it's very difficult to get a handle on these kinds of statistics without a homogeneous, well-defined samples. Um, but you know, taking the results as they stand right now, I I think it's reasonable to claim that roughly about seventy percent of the BGGs are quenched. In other words, they sit down here, and that seventy-five percent of the brightest cluster galaxies sit down here. The red points, again, are Romulus results. And um, there you can see the hint of the problem that I had flagged, the, the idea that there was, uh, we are seeing more disky systems uh, at, in the higher mass halos uh, shows up here again. When we look at the Romulus results, in the mass range, stellar mass range of 10 to the 11 to 10 to the 11.5, we find that only 45% of the systems are actually quenched. In other words, there is a preponderance for galaxies to be up here. And then if you go to a higher mass range, you see that even more galaxies tend to be up here. So instead of the trend being that you have greater number of quenched galaxies as you go to high masses, the Romulus trend seems to be the other way around. It's doing just fine at the lower mass rate regime of the group scale. But as you push up from to massive groups and into the cluster regime, you are starting to see the model struggling. Um, just to give you a flavor of what happens with some of the other simulations, I'm just going to speak, uh, you know, the results are right there. You can take a look at it. Uh, I'm just going to illustrate uh, the SIMBA and the TNG results. The SIMBA results for the same mass range, so these bins correspond to the same mass bins shown here on the plot, so 10 to 10.5 and so on and so forth. You, you can see that uh, on the scales of uh, 10.5 and greater, the number, the fraction of quenched galaxies is in fact 90% and tending towards 100%. So Simba, in, in a sense, is over quenching the galaxies. Uh, it's too efficient at quenching these massive galaxies. Um, illustrious TNG similarly has uh, a very efficient 
quenching uh, of the lower mass systems. The, of the lower mass systems, you're seeing 80 to 90% of the galaxies are quenched. As you get up to uh, more massive systems, the results are, are somewhat um, harder to get a handle on because the numbers are dropping off very quickly. But there is a hint that the fraction is dropping slightly. And uh, um, so in that sense, it's going in the same direction as Romulus, but the fractions themselves are starting out much higher in terms of quenched systems. We do know, for example, that in the, Rom in the TNG uh, simulations, when they, in the larger volumes, when they look at clusters, they find that all clusters tend to be non-cool core clusters. In other words, 100% of the galaxies really are quenched uh, as they get up to the highest mass end, which of course is problematic from, from the same perspective. So to recap this part of the talk, um, we have contemporary galaxy formations that have made considerable progress. I covered that part, but when we stress test these models, we find some interesting results. We find, for example, that most of the simulations uh, do reasonably well at up to a certain point, and then they start struggling. And the manner in which they struggle uh, varies. So if you focus on Simba and TNG, as I just did, you find that Simba and TNG both overquench on the group and cluster scale. The star forming fraction of central galaxies is too low. Romulus does exactly the opposite. Romulus underquenches, and therefore the star forming fraction is actually increasing with halo mass. And so this suggests that there's something uh, that the models, as much progress has been made, there are aspects of the model that needs to be revisited. What's going on? And I think that in order to understand what's going on, we have to realize that galaxy evolution models uh, need necessarily, well, they necessarily have to be holistic. It's not enough just to focus on the galaxies and the galaxy properties and try and get the galaxies right in and of themselves. Galaxies live in an environment. And what this is telling us is that the environment also needs to be correctly modeled as well. So for those of us who have been working on groups and clusters of galaxies, this is sort of par for the course. But this is a reminder again, that often uh, this uh, tends to get forgotten every now and then. And, and then results like this uh, remind us that galaxies, and, and if you look at this picture here, the, the central galaxy is sort of the, you know, the yellow orange dot in the center is sitting surrounded by a very baryon rich environment, whether this is uh, the CGM of a massive galaxy, whether it's the intra group medium or the intra cluster medium, this medium dominates the baryon budget. And it is susceptible to cooling. And so if you, you know, there is a mechanism, we, I think there's a consensus that the mechanism that's uh, affecting this particular component uh, in the late stages is AGN uh, feedback. And there is a competition between heating by AGN feedback and cooling, radiative cooling. And this balance between heating and cooling has to be done right. Uh, and if that's not done right, then we start to see the kinds of challenges that we are uh, witnessing. I can show you a little bit further um, what I mean by this. Uh, here we have uh, Ben Oppenheimer and I and, and Ian McCarthy and, and a group of us wrote a review of, of the state of the art as far as numerical models of groups are concerned. Um, I'm plotting from that a entropy plot. This is showing the entropy of the gas, of the gas not the, you know, that's outside the galaxy as a function of radius. And what I want you to see is that the, the, the sort of the cacophony of, of dashed lines in the background are showing you what the observations look like. We have light yellow dashed lines showing the entropy profiles of uh, clusters of galaxies. 
And then the purple lines are showing the entropy profiles from the clog groups. And the solid curves here and the dashed thick curves are showing the entropy profiles from the numerical simulations. The solid curves are showing numericals uh, from the TNG. The dashed ones are showing from Romulus. And you can right away see why one is over quenching and the other is under quenching. The state of the affairs are entropy profiles that looked uh, you know, more or less like power laws. Or if you're looking at it at cluster scales, they'll come in and some of them will continue down like Romulus. Others will tend to flatten out and you have a diversity of entropy cores in the central regions of clusters of galaxies and the entropy profiles of groups seem to have a very distinct behavior in their own right, regardless of whether they're cool core groups or not. What we find is that none of the models captures this. Um, the, the fact that uh, TNG results essentially have this large, very flat entropy core means that most of these systems are non-cool core clusters. And not surprisingly, non-cool core clusters do not cool efficiently and therefore uh, they overquench because there is no flow of gas into the centers in, in even in, in a small number of, of galaxies. Whereas Romulus cannot get a core. Um, this is a core that has formed, it's a transient core and it's formed out of mergers, not out of AGN feedback. And so we know that the AGN feedback in the most massive, these results are from Romulus C. We know that in the most massive halos, the AGN feedback um, is, is not quite able to keep the central regions warm enough and, and prevent uh, gas from cooling and entering the system. So we have two very separate behavior. And so again, to recap this part of the presentation, and I guess I need a time, um, I, I need a yeah, sense of where I am. Five minutes, another five minutes, sorry, if that's okay. Yeah, that's great. Actually, I, I you know, yeah, that, that, that's fine. Yeah, so, you know, if I was to, uh, if, I, if I can sort of summarize now what I've been saying and, and sort of bring in successes and opportunities. So I've told you where these models are, are doing incredibly well. I have also told you areas where these models are struggling. For a graduate student population, struggles are also opportunities. It is, uh, it's, it's an arena where you have an opportunity to do something clever and, and, and to make a contribution. So um, I would argue that the main problem in our simulations is really coming down to AGN feedback. We've been working on AGN feedback. Uh, we've been working with AGN feedback on a variant of Simba in-house. We've been trying to understand it uh, in collaboration with Ramil within the Simba context. And since I'm also part of the Romulus collaboration, we've been having these discussions and on, on, on the Romulus side as well. Uh, it is a challenge and it's a challenge for two reasons. First, most of these models uh, model accretion onto uh, the supermassive black holes via Bondi accretion. This is an accretion mode where you have gravity of the black hole is simply pulling in and creating a flow from the hot environment. It's, you know, think of it as a gravitational capture of the hot gas and the hot gas will then stream in. The black hole is a sink. And so without, a, without having a central sort of regime where you can create a back pressure, the gas, no matter how hot, will trickle in. Bondi model is, is that model, that hot gas trickles into the black hole. The rate at which it trickles depends on how hot the gas is, but it does trickle in. That's the simplest model for uh, gas flow into a black hole. It turns out that uh, the real systems, and when we look at very high resolution simulations, not cosmological idealized simulations of, 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 of clusters of galaxies, we find all sorts of very rich phenomena taking place. Specifically, the gas as it's cooling will fragment into clouds and clumps, and these clouds and clumps will fall in. 
And when cold clouds fall in, they do not fall onto a black hole and feed it bondy like they feed it in a very different mode. And you go through these very intense heating and cooling cycles. And so in the first instance, the accretion mode onto the black hole is, is not quite being modeled correctly. We already understand that the challenge is to figure out how to do it. We also know that jets, which is the dominant AGN feedback mode, are very high velocity, low mass loading phenomena. So they are high momentum, but they're not high momentum because there's a lot of mass being ejected, but rather the velocities are very high. But to get a, a, a process that has low mass, when your numerical simulations themselves have a limited sort of numerical resolution that the smallest gas particle is 10 to the five solar masses, uh, trying to eject a low mass jet turns out to be impossible. Um, there are people playing around with this by, for example, fragmenting a gas particle into tiny little particles, shooting out those tiny particles. They see a very different behavior. In some instances, it looks much more realistic. But if you try and do that in a cosmological simulation on a repeated basis, that can dramatically slow down the simulation. So um, while we're figuring this out, in the intermediate time, during the intermediate time, um, there is, you know, varieties of solutions that 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 one can think about. Some of them will range from uh, clever ways to do a subgrid model. We know that these processes are happening on scales so far below the resolution of the simulation that uh, it's not going to be possible to directly uh, simulate them. If we were to do that, the dynamic range of the simulations would be so large that it would take forever to run these simulations. So some clever way of modeling them either directly, say using this fragmentation picture or uh, doing some sort of a, a smart way to distribute energy with the knowledge that you are not quite doing it physically uh, from first principles, but that numerical constraints are forcing you to do it, but then you have to figure out how to do it in a quasi-realistic fashion. Um, these are opportunities for students who are you know, interested in this area. Um, I had five minutes. I'm probably down to two minutes or one minute. And I think that rather than switch to something else, I will stop right here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Many thanks, Arif. This wonderful and holistic, I would say, talk. <laughs> uh, so if there are any questions, please, uh, uh, you can just uh, go ahead and ask them. Or if you want me to uh, say that for you, you can just write it in the chat. Uh, so basically, I can kick off with an easy question so that it can be uh, maybe a discussion opener. Uh, so uh, mainly, yes, the, the reason is, uh, so why we see uh, the difference between Romulus and the TNG simulations is that the, the agent feedback is not uh, actually uh, well uh, inputted in the simulations. Um, and you have stressed out now uh, how this can change, but uh, can this also uh, be done in a way, in a continuous way, for example? So it, all I mean is that we know that uh, agent feedback can occur in periods of time, right? In time, in a shorter or larger time scale. So um, how can this be now included in the simulations in the sense that, uh, so that you don't, let's say, over, uh, let's say, do an overkill with agent feedback or how you can, in a way, yeah, do it properly, yes. Uh, yeah, I have to say that we are struggling with that. So we, um, Douglas Renahan, my PhD student, um, is has been working on this problem uh, amongst other problems that he's been working on. This has been one of the one of the areas that he's been focusing on, and we, you know, a lot of the simulations, Romulus, um, TNG, Sim, uh, Simba, sort of getting there now. Uh, initially, only treated AGN feedback as a 
as a single phenomenon. So there was no attempt to distinguish between quasar mode and radio mode for that, for that matter. Um, partly because as I pointed out, modeling radio mode in some reasonable realistic fashion is difficult. So, you know, since you weren't gonna do that without some clever approach, uh, the first thing was let's just do the quasar mode. And, you know, and, and so, the first sort of pass at trying to fix this is to try and uh, separate out the two modes. What we're finding is that um, at this point, you know, the, you know, the latest results we're finding is that we can actually get an amazingly good galaxy properties, these global galaxy properties that I showed at the very beginning of my talk, uh, just with the quasar mode and then the, a, that the ADAF mode almost becomes irrelevant. And, it, it, and we now know why it's becoming irrelevant and it's sort of similar to what's happening in the TNG or Simba, that there is this very powerful set of quasar outbursts going on at Redshift 2, which, is, uh, which directly contributes to the quenching of the galaxies and the downturn in the star formation, you know, in the cosmic star formation history. And so if you wanna match the rapidity with which that star formation density has decreased, you want to be able to get quenched large galaxies. It seems like some sort of a, <coughs> excuse me, uh, a powerful bursts are needed, but the bursts are actually too powerful. And so they are so powerful that they evacuate the gas at redshift two, and then that's it. There is no gas left at the, in the inner regions. And so, you know, when you look at the mean um, AGN power at late times, sorry, median AGN power at late times, it's like 10 to the 35 ergs per second, which is a tenth of the cooling luminosity. Um, so the gas is cooling, but there is not, it's not cooling fast enough in the center to be able to reignite the AGN feedback. And then when it does, it reignites it in the quasar mode again, which is explosive. And, and so you go through these crazy cycles. Romulus tried to do it very differently. And, and you know, Romulus at, at one, you know, in, in a sense, there was no attempt to calibrate the large mass galaxies. Everybody else tries at some level to calibrate the large mass galaxies because you want to get that sharp downturn in the Schechter function. The Romulus didn't do that. They, they, they calibrated in dwarf galaxies and Milky Way-like galaxies and completely left the massive galaxies as a, as a free regime for testing. And you know, I was surprised at how well it worked up to the point that it did. Um, but again, we're finding that the AGN feedback is not being uh, not powerful enough as you get to higher and higher masses. And that may just suggest that that may, you know, that the Romulus has a good starting point for doing AGN feedback in galaxies. And now we need an add-on that is a more realistic and more reasonable ADAF mode, a radio mode, if you will. Uh, and you know, if we can figure that out, then I think we will be in a good shape. But again, the trick is radio mode is challenging because it's a very low mass mode. Uh, it's, it's a high momentum low mass mode and trying to do low mass modes in finite resolution simulations is problems. People have tried, for example, rather than shooting jets out or winds out, they seed a bubble. Um, uh, Deborah Sijaki, for example, at Cambridge has tried that with varying degrees of success. Um, so there are people trying different, uh, making attempts of different types, but I, I haven't seen anything that, that uh, really is both compelling and, uh, and, and doing something reasonable. I would be personally willing to sacrifice compelling at the moment because we just don't have the resolution, but I, I would like to see something that actually has some bearing in reality. Uh, yeah, so yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, this sounds like, yeah, it, it has, uh, let's say the problem has been spotted and now this is the, uh, 
the way now is being worked to try to find the pin down the properties and the solution for this. Yeah, and I think that this is where opportunity for you know yeah. smart graduate students coming up with uh, clever ideas. This is this is this is the wild west frontier. <laughs> Indeed. So I can ask again any questions from our audience, any kind of. No. Okay. If, if that's so, so let's uh, thank our speaker uh, for this uh, wonderful uh, talk and uh, for this, uh, again, I would say holistic view about uh, uh, galaxy formation and evolution within groups and clusters. And uh, that's the, the, the point is that the problem has been spotted, and it's uh, it's a uh, yeah it's a start as uh, uh, it's it's an approach where you see this the problem as a start of new things, and uh, I really like this uh, idea and uh, the way to see things, uh, especially in astrophysics. So, well, thank you very much for hosting me. I, it was a it was certainly a pleasure. That was great. Thank you so much. Thanks. And thanks also everyone for attending. All right.